Good morning. Allow me first to thank Schiller Institute and in particular to, to thank uh, Helga Zepp LaRouche for inviting me to this very important conference and allowing me to contribute to this very important panel. But before I start my paper, which is called Reconstruction with Syrian Characteristics, I would like to pass on a few notes that lead me to the conclusions which I would love to conclude for this panel and for this conference at large. One of the major problems we face in our countries is that today Western countries approach our countries with a feeling of exceptionalism or a feeling of righteousness that whatever Western countries see appropriate or good should apply to our countries without any question. The first action that was taken by Western countries when the war on Syria started was to withdraw their ambassadors from Syria. The question is, isn't it the job of ambassadors to convey the reality on the ground and to help in opening channels of communication between countries instead of closing them? This, this leads me to the role of the corporate media during the war on Syria. Unfortunately, most Western media relied on Al Jazeera and Qatar funded and Al Arabiya, Saudi funded, to report about events in Syria. Although both channels, Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya, withdrew their correspondence and relied on what is called eyewitnesses, which could be anybody, anywhere. This applies also to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is run by one person in Coventry, UK, Rami Abdurrahman. These media outlets chose to focus on what they find fit, on what fits their agenda, ignoring the reality on the ground. For example, the events, the terrorist acts in Tartus and Jeble uh, recently, which claimed the lives of 200 innocent civilians, were not noticed by Western media and certainly did not therefore invoke any Western sympathy. What I would like to say is that the false narrative propagated about Syria was as dangerous to the Syrian people and to the safety and security of Syrians as the terrorist acts perpetrated by terrorists because it isolated the reality in Syria from the public understanding in the West and the world at large. And it prevented creating a level of understanding between Western countries and the Syrian people about what is going on. But before we could begin to talk about reconstructing Syria, we still face the monumental challenge of eradicating terrorism in Syria, Iraq, and the region. We have to eradicate this terrorism. And when I say we, I do not mean the Syrians or the Iraqis alone, but I mean the world at large, because as we have seen in Paris, Bruxelles, Orlando, and lastly UK, terrorists can strike anywhere in the world. It's a cancer that can spread anywhere in the world. However, is the world, and in particular Western powers, doing all what they can to face this danger? This is the question that I would like to ask. Of course, if we separate what is promoted in media and look at actions and deeds rather than on words, we see that in the Syrian case, Western countries are not doing what needs to be done in order to eliminate this danger, both from Syria and from the world at large. And I would like to give you one example. On the 17th of December 2015, Security Council adopted the resolution 2253, which under Chapter 7, which dictates stopping financing, arming, facilitating terrorists into Syria. The Vienna group afterward interpreted this resolution that it should conclude with closing the Turkish border 
and not allowing ter armament and finances to cross to terrorists. On the 18th of December, the Security Council issued another resolution, 2254, which calls for a political solution in Syria. Now you see that the entire humanity focuses on 2254 without dealing with 2253, which is a logical prerequisite for 2254, i.e. for finding a political solution in Syria. The same thing can be said about humanitarian assistance. Instead of focusing on ending the war on Syria and on restoring peace and security in Syria, we see that the entire corporate media is speaking about humanitarian assistance as if this is the issue. Syria, before this war, was able to host two million Iraqis and to feed itself and to export food to 84 countries in the world. It is since the 70s that the Syrian people adopted the logo, we eat from what we produce and we wear from what ma we manufacture, which means that Syria does not need the humanitarian help if there was peace and stability in Syria, and if the Syrian people are able to, uh, uh, to develop their crops and to attend to their factories. Today, we hear a lot of talk from the Western Alliance about uh, containing ISIS, limiting ISIS. And lastly, you all heard the chief of CIA, Joe Bernan, who said that we did not succeed even in limiting the influence of ISIS. Why? Because there is no real desire and wish, really, to get rid of ISIS. There are two things. The Russian government calls on Western countries in order to join efforts to defeat ISIS, both in Syria and Iraq. And the agreement in Vienna was that the Turkish borders should be closed. None of these two factors were responded to positively by the United States or by Western powers. The question is why, if there is a real will to fight ISIS. The other question is that we in Syria feel that what is needed is a real will in the international community to fight terrorism and to build real bridges. When I say real bridges, I mean on equal basis, on a matter of parity. The problem with the promoting democracy between brackets in our part of the world is that Western countries believe that their liberal democracy is the only issue or the only copy or the only uh, formula that should be applied to our countries. And this is not true because we all have different cultures. We have different identities. We have different habits. We have different ways of lives. And I can give an example like China, India, uh, Persian culture, Arab culture have contributed a great deal to the world. But on a human basis and on a matter of parity, in fact, here I would like to make an important point that the Western world believes in opening markets to the entire world, but only to export its own goods, but not to allow other countries to export to the West on equal basis. And every day they invent different formulas in order not to allow equal way of treatment, tariff constraints and other constraints. The same thing applies to politics. The concepts, values, ideas coming from the West should be respected and implemented in our countries. But there is no other road that takes our culture and our values and our ethics to the West. If we need to create a world for all, if we need to create a peaceful world, if we need to create a prosperous world for all, we need to create a conceptual, intellectual concept of one world. We need to create a conceptual concept of a Silk Road, not only an actual th Silk Road, but an intellectual Silk Road. All of you know that Aleppo and Syria were 
extremely crucial in the ancient Silk Road that connected Asia to Europe. Syria and the Syrian people will be more than happy to be also very active in a new Silk Road, in a political, social, intellectual Silk Road that connects Asia to the West, that connects Euro-Asia to the West. So the other byproduct of this war on our countries and the other byproduct of promoting only Western exceptionalism in our country is the distortion of the image of Islam in Western eyes. Islam, like any other religion, is a religion of love, a religion of humanity. We, we as Muslims are hardly, if ever, addressed in our Quran as Muslims. We are addressed as ye human beings. We are part of the human community. And therefore, those who kill in the name of Islam, those who destroy in the name of Islam, are not Muslims at all. They have nothing to do with Islam. We have to address the concepts that the terrorists are promoting. And the lack of dialogue that the corporate media is causing between our countries. If we want to create a truly prosperous Silk Road, not only factual, but also intellectual, social, and political. And here, I would like to conclude by thanking Russia and China, who right from the beginning of the war on Syria, took four vetoes against Western attempts to try and strike Syria militarily. And Russia and China and Iran continue to support the Syrian people and to try to find political solution. In brief, what I would like to say here is that in order to build these Silk Roads, we have to deal with each other on equal basis, on equal human basis, and dealing otherwise as superior and inferior, as white and black, as important and less important, is producing extremism, is producing racism, which is striking, not only in Syria, but in Brussels, in Paris, in Orlando, and last of all, in UK. Thus, it's in the interest of humanity to think as human beings, to think of the world as truly a human village, where people live equally and have mutual respect for each other and deal on the basis of parity. But this requires a huge change in the mindset of the West. It probably requires another confidence to speak not only about the very important idea launched by China about building a Silk Road, but to speak about intellectual, social, and political Silk Road that thinks and deals with all of us as human, as brothers and sisters, rather than as superior and inferior. Thus, we can build a new world, and one world, and a much better world than the one we live in. We have an obligation to our grandchildren, wherever they are born, to leave them a better world than this one in which we live now. Thank you very much.